exercising demons, casting demons out, is not clear at all. There is no nothing in the Old Testament, at least to surface reading, that is about this. So, where in the world would would they get this idea? Why would people uh, living, you know, during the experiences of of you know the incarnation, Jesus' first advent? When he's going around casting out demons, why would they just look at that and say, well, of course, you know, this is the son of David. This is what the son of David's supposed to do. Where would they get this idea? What preconditioned them to expecting that this was going to happen? What preconditioned them to the, to the fact that once they saw somebody do this, they said, aha, you know, we have here the son of David, the Messiah. What, what was it that led them to that point where they could process what was going on uh, correctly. So that's what we want to talk about. And we really have to begin, surprisingly enough, in the Old Testament. And, and this is going to be some obscure stuff, but I'm going to quote one passage in the Old Testament, then I'm going to quote it in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Again, that a lot of people, a lot of Jews, Jews or Gentiles, would have been familiar with. I mean, mostly Jews before you know, we have the first advent, because you know, if you're a Gentile, you don't really have any interest in reading stuff that Jews wrote. I mean, if you're an intellectual, you might, but the, again, the masses don't. When Gentiles start becoming converted after, you know, the resurrection or the, the, the ministry of the apostles, well, then you get a lot of Gentiles reading the Septuagint because, hey, that's, that, that's your Bible. You know, this is, this is where the, the Messiah was presented. Well, prior to that, again, you, you do have something in the Septuagint that the Jewish community, because they're the ones who are going to be reading this, either in Hebrew or the Targums, Aramaic, or in this case, the Septuagint, they're going to be familiar with this idea. And so I'm going to, I'm going to start the passage from 1 Kings 4. And I'm going to read it, both versions, and then we're going to go into the Dead Sea Scrolls and talk about extra Psalms <laughs> that are in the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least one of which actually shows up in the Septuagint. So again, people would have been familiar with the material. So prepping it that way, here we go. In 1 Kings 4, 29 through 34, the Masoretic text, and again, the traditional Masoretic text reads as follows. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand of the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the wisdom of, the, of Egypt. Skip into verse 32. He, Solomon, also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and birds and reptiles, fish, so on and so forth. So that's 1 Kings 4, 29 through roughly you know, 33, uh, right around there. So we have the mention of Solomon. Solomon is obviously son of David, king Okay, he's he's going to be a messianic figure in, in, in that sense. And we have here the information that he spoke 3,000 Proverbs and his songs were 1,005. Big deal. You know I mean, how, how do you get casting out demons from that? Well, you don't, but it begins sort of a journey that that, you know, is initiated in what's said here about Solomon that will get picked up in other material. In the Septuagint, it's slightly different. Okay, the difference here is in verse 32. And Solomon spoke 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs were 5,000. So there's a lot more songs in the Septuagint version than there is than there are in the Masoretic Text version. And that's because, as we move to the Dead Sea Scroll material, that's because the Jewish community, and of course the community that would have, that's part of the community that would have produced the Septuagint, knew of lots of other psalms. And we're going to focus on one of those that shows up in the Dead Sea Scroll material that is actually not only interesting, but references, and here's the key thought, it, the, the scrolls material references what we just read in 1 Kings 4 about the songs and the, I'm going to use a very suggestive word here, the utterances of Solomon. Okay, so this is 11Q. Okay, 11Q Psalm Scroll, and the abbreviation is AP Superscript A. In, in numbers, it's 11Q 5, column 27. For those of you who have Dead Sea Scroll stuff, you can go look this up, but I'm going to read you parts of it. So this is a, a psalm about David. So we read here at the beginning, this is line 2, David, son of Jesse, was wise, and a light like the light of the sun, and learned, and perfect in all his paths before God and men. And then we have a blank. And the Lord Yahweh gave him a discerning and enlightened spirit. And he wrote Psalms, 3,600 
and songs to be sung before the altar over the perpetual, and then there's a gap in the text, line nine. And all the songs which he spoke were 446. And songs to perform over the possessed, <laughs> four of them. So you actually have a reference in this extra psalm to David, okay, David composing songs to perform over the possessed. The total, again, of all of this was 4,050. Again, the, the total of his, his total output. When you get down to, to that particular line, line 10 in, in that Dead Sea Scroll text. Now, the word translated possessed is more literally uh, someone who has been assaulted, uh, someone who has been, you know, accosted. Again, the implication is by, you know, some external force. But it's just an odd line. Songs to perform over the possessed or over the assaulted, four of them. And the last line here, and all these he spoke through the spirit of prophecy, which had been given to him from before the Most High. So God gave him these things to, these songs to sing, uh, so on and so forth. Now, in the same Dead Sea Scroll, in a different column, column 19, line 15, we read this where David says, Let not Satan rule over me, nor an evil spirit. Let neither pain nor evil purpose, again, conquer me. Now, part of that, that line, part of you know, this, this little, this, these snippets that I've read, part of this material shows up in the Septuagint as what the Septuagint calls Psalm 151. Now, if you know your, your Bible, if you know the book of Psalms, there's only 100, and, I think there's 150 Psalms here. And, you know, you've got this extra Psalm, you know, we, we okay, you know, the Masoretic text, you know, we've, we've got this nice, you know, neat number here. Where in the world do we get this extra Psalm? Well, there were, if you think about the Psalms, let's, let's just do this a little bit. There are references in the Psalms to the Psalms of David and, and others, not just David, but we're going to zero in on David here. The Psalms of David being collected. And this again, this was the process. They were collected and put into the books so that in the Masoretic text, we have 150 total. And there are even places in the Psalms where it says, and these are the, this is the end of the songs of David, son of Jesse. But then afterwards, you get more Psalms of David. And that's because the collecting kept going. So at one point, you know, they had a collection, Psalms of David, and then an, an editor, you know, who was putting the, all this stuff together into the book that we know as Psalms. An editor says, hey, these are the Psalms of David, the songs of David, uh, and, and this is, this is all, all that we have. But then they find more, and those get added subsequently to those editorial comments in the, uh, in, in the book of Psalms as we have it today. Now, I mention that because here we have a 151st Psalm that actually winds up in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Dead Sea Scroll material, and it was added to the collection that becomes part of the Septuagint. So in the, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, if you turn to the book of Psalms, you're going to have an extra one. You're going to have Psalm 151. And in that Psalm, you get, again, some of this, this material about don't let Satan rule over me or an evil spirit. Of course, the implications are because of what, you know, David had written, you know, songs to perform over the possessed, you know, that he has power uh, to deliver people from being bound by demons. Now, let's go to another one, Psalm 91. This is Psalm 91, which, again, you have your traditional version, okay, what you would read in most translations, translating the Masoretic text. You have a version of this that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Psalm 91 at Qumran, again, and not coincidentally, it is part of this same scroll, the 11Q Psalm scroll that I've been quoting already. And then, of course, you also have a version of this in what becomes known as the Septuagint. Now, I'm going to read you this. There are four things in here that are very interesting that speak to this issue. And for those of you who remember the, uh, the Fern and Audrey episode, Fern and Audrey and I have, have discussed some elements of this particular psalm because of the work they do. Uh, again, they don't do renunciation prayers or anything like that. They, they're not deliverance ministry. What they do is different, but they have used the material in this psalm and some other things to help them do what they do. And I think you'll understand why that's relevant as we read through this. So I'm just going to go, you know, we'll pick, you know, one of the versions because I'm going to actually link out to a few things and then talk about where it might be different. 
But we read here Psalm, 1, Psalm 91, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Okay, now, now look at the reference. We already had, had Psalm 151. Again, don't let Satan rule over me. We already had a, a portion of, of an extra, uh, you know, extra psalm material that had songs about dealing with possessed people. And there was a reference made to, hey, David wrote these things through power given to him from the Most High. And here we have the Most High referenced in Psalm 91. Now, if, again, if you've read anything in the Unseen Realm, you know that this is important terminology. Because the Most High, again, this is the title given to the God of Israel when he divides up the nations. Again, it, it, it's a title of superiority. He is the Most High. He is the one, uh, you know, who made this decision, you know, who, he, who judges, you know, the rebellious, you know, divine beings of Genesis 6, who, who, who dealt with the Nakash of Genesis 3. Again, you have this Most High terminology. And that's, that's important because you have to assert authority. You have to presume and assert and, and actually legitimately have authority over other Elohim, over other divine beings, again, to, to do what you're going to do, to, to do what needs to be done. And so there's this, again, conceptual link back to we're doing this because of the Most High and his power. But the Messiah, son, you know, son of David, was, again, he, you know, Jesus is actually called Son of the Most High in the Gospels. And that is a messianic title because the king of Israel, again, the king the, from the line of David, is referred to as the son of God in the Old Testament. So again, there's this linkage about the, the, the messianic figure, son of David, you know, son of Solomon, line of David and Solomon, son of the Most High, son of God, all this sort of stuff factoring into what this psalm, and again, what Jesus actually does in the Gospels with demonic entities. So he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. Now here we get hit verses 5 and 6. We're going to get some lines in here that it's very easy to read right over, but we're going to be linking out to some things and talking about them. You will not fear the terror of the night. Hear the terror of the night. In Old Testament thinking, this was actually a demonic entity. Now, if you have the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, again, I've recommended that, that source many, many times. This term is discussed. There's actually an entry for the terror of the night in DDD. And the the Hebrew for this is Pachad Laila. Okay, now Laila is the important thing to sort of fix in your brain, Laila, the way that sounds. Because, to quote the article, there have been some attempts to relate Laila etymologically to Lilit, which is referenced in Isaiah 34, 14. This is Lilith, again, the, which is a demonic figure in, in uh, Jewish tradition. But the entry continues Akkadian Lili is actually a better choice. Akkadian Lili was a night demon. So Lili, Lila, it's different than Lilit. It's close, but it's not quite the same. But this term, Pakad Lila, DDD suggests, you know, there might be some relationship here. They say this is a, a folk etymology. Functionally, however, the demon Pakad Lila reveals traits similar to those of the Mesopotamian Lilu and the Lili, especially as it's referenced in the Song of Solomon 3 8, uh, which talks about, again, the, the, the terror of the night. We're not going to necessarily go there. But you get this idea that there's an Akkadian term that aligns with this one that has characteristics that would sort of fit with, again, a, a demonic figure, terror of the night. Now, the terror of the night demon in Mesopotamia was, again, an aggressive, attacking entity. And the night association is significant because that's when lots of, you know, people sort of thought about when, you know, when demons are doing something. And it also has reference to what happens at night, specifically in bed between men and women. Okay, the, there's the marital bed. Uh, also, again, ch the, the, the care of children during the night while they're asleep. Because the, the, the Akkadian demons associated with this were, were often associated with 
children dying during the night and, and, and whatnot, or trying to prevent conception. Again, there, there's this, again, there's this notion of, of demonic activity during the, the midnight hours, I guess you could put it. And this term is associated with that. And I want to read you a little bit more from the DDD entry. He says, the writer says, among the host of Mesopotamian demons, Li Lu, which is related to Sumerian Lu Li La, which literally means wind man. So it's like a, a, a spirit man. Among the host of Mesopotamian demons, Li Lu and Li Li Tu or Li Li most resemble the biblical Pakad Lila. These demons seem to have been attached particularly to pregnant women and newborns whom they sought to harm. Uh, they are conceived as harmful to brides and grooms whom they attack on their wedding night and prevent the consummation of the marriage. As an attacker of brides and grooms, Lilu, or especially in Jewish tradition, Lilit, comes close, now catch this line, comes close to the incubus and succubus demons known from all over the world. Again, just giving you a little bit little bit of a flavor of what's going on here. Again, this I don't want to drift off into, you know, facade territory or alien abduction stuff, but but thematically there's a lot of overlap here between uh, you know, like and sleep paralysis, even though I think sleep paralysis is just a biological medical condition, but you know, it's often associated with feeling like a presence in the room. But again, you 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 get these sorts of things. I'm just trying to pluck examples out so that you get a feel for what this term in antiquity would have been uh, used to describe or or uh, th how this term would have been uh, brought into discussion based upon some experience somebody had, whether it was supernatural or, or, or something that just freaked them out. That might have been natural or not. So this this is the terminology that's going on in this particular psalm, back to the terror of the night in Psalm 91. A cursory look, last line from DDD, a cursory look at the context in which Pakhad Lila occurs in Psalm 91 reveals its demonic identity. This psalm abounds with names of other demons. And it does. Let's go back to Psalm 91. Verse 5, we read, You shall not fear the terror of the night. Here's the next one. Nor the arrow that flies by day. And you say, well, isn't that just like an arrow? I don't want to get stuck with an arrow that somebody shot off. Well, again, there's a little bit more to it than that, especially if you are reading this psalm in the Septuagint. Because in the Septuagint, instead of arrow that flies by day, you actually get daimonion mesem brinon, which means midday demon. <laughs> okay, so you will not feel the, the terror of the night, the nighttime demons, and you won't fear the midday demons either in the Septuagint. Now, DDD also has a reference to this. I'll read you a few excerpts. The midday demon is found in the Septuagint version of Psalm 91. In that case, it's verse 6. English Bibles, it's going to be verse 5. In these verses, the Hebrew psalmist declares that the one who takes refuge in the Almighty will not fear. Again, Masoretic text, terror the night or the arrow that flies by day. And then it continues to the pestilence and the destruction. And we're going to get to those in a moment. Those are also names of gods in antiquity, in Canaanite religion. And they're referred, those gods are referred to as demons in the Septuagint. But just hold that thought for a moment. So back to the entry for midday demon. Again, this is the Septuagint version. The Septuagint translators, continuing with the entry, confronted a different Hebrew text. And then he references probably the same ones that Aquila and Symmachus used. Uh, and then he, gives, he gets into the Hebrew for what they probably read. Destruction and demon of noontime. Again, according to the, the, the Hebrew text, they probably had. Which the Septuagint renders as misfortune and the midday demon. So it's very clear in the Septuagint that what they are reading, and, and again, D.D. says they probably you know had a text that actually led them this direction. A Hebrew text is a little bit different than the Masoretic text, but in this verse, you know, they're, they're, the, the, the psalmist is saying, you know, you, you won't if you if you're under the shelter of the Most High, the one who's really in charge of again all these other entities, you will not fear the terror of the night the nighttime demon. You will not fear, again, the midday demon, the one that shows up, you know, in the middle of the day, that, that sort of thing. You won't need to fear these things. Now, before we leave this, if you go with the Masoretic text, the arrow that flies by day, there are scholars who would actually argue, and with, well, I think this is a reasonable argument, 
that the reference to the arrow provides a clue actually to a demonic entity because in Canaanite religion, the god Reshef, who was a plague god, is represented as an archer, someone who shoots arrows. And so that, again, that might have contributed, that knowledge in, in antiquity might have contributed to the, the Septuagint translator when he's looking at what he looks at and he has different options. It might have led him to say, okay, we got it, midday demon, you know, this, we, we get it because of this, this, the way Reshef, again, was depicted, described in Canaanite literature. So even if you want to go with MT, you don't like Septuagint, you can still be dealing with a demonic entity here. And Reshef, again, was, it was a deity, it was a god in, in, in Canaanite religion. Continuing on to the next verse, so you won't feel the terror of the night, you won't you know, need to fear the, either the arrow, again, the, the Reshef's darts. Remember you know, what Paul talks about, the fiery darts you know, of the wicked? It's the same idea, but here in the Old Testament, that here you have a, a deity associated with this, uh, represented as an archer, shooting at his victims, that sort of thing. Uh, or if you go with the Septuagint, the midday demon. We continue, nor will you have to fear the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Now, so you, now, catch what, what the psalmist just did there. The previous verse, we have terror of the night, nighttime demon, and then we have a daytime demon. Next verse, we have a pe the pestilence that's stalking in the darkness. So there we go with nighttime, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. And we have noonday at reference again. So you could take verses five and six as parallel to each other. It's another way, again, instead of that, instead of it yielding four demonic figures, it would only be two demonic figures described two times in different ways. Either way, these are, these are hostile divine entities, hostile gods in Canaanite literature that are, again, viewed as the forces of darkness, spiritual forces of darkness that the psalmist is saying, you don't need to fear these things. Now, let's talk about pestilence a little bit, this term. And this is something that, you know, shows up in a footnote somewhere in Unseen Realm. I know, I don't quite remember what the chapter was, but the Hebrew word here is dever. Again, pestilence is, is a normal translation. But the thing to notice here, to be aware of, is that this dever Okay, is a deity name in the Ugaritic texts, and he is the god, a god of destruction. Now, again, Dever in Ugaritic text is also mentioned in concert with, in tandem with Reshef. That was the arrow demon, the archer demon that we just read about in the previous verse. So again, this, this is what that, that quote in DDD much earlier said, hey, the context of Psalm 91 supports this demonic thinking, because look at all these terms in the psalm that point to demonic entities. See, that, that was an accurate quote. There, there, are, there are a number of things in the psalm that point that direction. Uh, Dever is also mentioned in Habakkuk 3. Uh, again, we have there, we might as well just go out to Habakkuk 3, where Dever and Reshef are actually in this scene. We have here, uh, I'll just start at the beginning. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. So there you have Dever and Reshef mentioned in this. And in, the, in this scene, they are sort of like cringing, you know, servants. They're underlings of the God of Israel. Again, this, this the, the prayer of Habakkuk here puts them in their place. So they're not, you know, independent, you know, more powerful entities or anything like that. Uh, you know, the God of Israel can use destruction and he can use pestilence and that, that sort of thing. It, but what you get is you get in Canaanite religion, these are distinct deities and they're in opposition, of course, to what's going on in Israel. And in the psalm, you know, they become enemies. They become rebels. They become threats, you know, to, to, the, to God's people. And that's why we have this psalm that you don't need to fear these entities because the God of Israel is more powerful than they are. And in fact, again, the, the, the supposition is that the Most High can and will deliver you uh, from these things. So let's go to, again, quickly... The other reference, the destruction reference, this is not Reshef, this is Ketev. The term Ketev appears four times in the Old Testament, DDD again. Its basic significance is destruction. In Ugaritic, this name would be pronounced Kezev, and it occurs once in Ugaritic 
And Kezev is a buddy or kinsman of Mot, the god of death uh, in Ugritic thinking. And in Hosea 13, 14, we get a reference to this, this kind of material. He's, this is the, it's going to sound like a familiar passage, but think about this passage and think about where it's referenced in the New Testament. Hosea says, again, and, and the speaker here is, um, let me get the context here for the speaker, Hosea 13. Uh, it is the prophet. It's talking about he destroys you, O Israel. Again, it, Hosea basically giving Israel bad news for their idolatry. And then we get to verse 14. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Again, the realm of the dead. Shall I redeem them from death? The word moat. O death, O moat, where are your plagues? And the word there is dever. <laughs> o Sheol, where is your sting? The word there is ketev. Compassion is hidden from my eyes. Now, where do we see that quoted in the New Testament? O death, okay, where is your sting? Okay, all that sort of thing. We get it in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And it's a passage about the resurrection, okay? Because the resurrected Messiah and the resurrection itself conquers death, conquers Sheol, conquers the, the plagues that, you know, people get that send them to the underworld. You know, it conquers the destruction, again, that results in people dying and all this sort of stuff. It's a reference to, again, the, the, the power of the God of Israel over these forces, these entities, these things, and ultimately even the power of death. Well, that's important because all of those things, the resurrection, is tied to the Messiah. Okay, this was, this was the plan of salvation. The Messiah needs to die and rise again to, again, complete, to really bring, in, bring into effect, uh, kickstart, bring to, to fruition the whole plan of salvation, salvation history in the Old Testament. And the Messiah is the son of David. The Messiah is the son of Solomon. Okay, the, again, the Davidic line. All of these ideas, again, are interconnected in the Old Testament mind in, in, as part of the messianic profile. The Messiah will have power over the terror of the night. The Messiah will have power over the terror of the day. Again, new, nighttime demon, daytime demon. The Messiah will have power over pestilence, dever, destruction, ketev. Both of them are buddies of moat, death, in Hosea 13, 14. The Messiah will have the power over, now can I catch what I'm saying here? Again, if you've read the Unseen Realm, this is going to click with you pretty, pretty easily. The, the Messiah has the power over the realm of death, the Lord of the dead, who is Satan, and everybody who works for him. Okay, the minions in the, in the realm of the dead who are, in the Old Testament context, they're described by these God terms, these, these pseudo-lesser hostile God terms. In the Septuagint, this terminology is going to be put into de demonic terms. And in the New Testament in Greek, the, it, all of this is going to, be, going to be put under demonic terms. Because this is where the demons dwell. Yes, the demons in the in the Gospels, demons in the New Testament, are the spirits of the dead Nephilim. We get that. Again, we're not going to go over all that that ground in, in this podcast episode. But this is where they live. Okay, even in the Old Testament, you get that. You know, you you get the the dead Rephaim who are descent who are Anakim who are descendants of the Nephilim. You get them living in the underworld. They live in the realm of the dead. They come out, they seek embodiment, they seek to possess people. Again, we, un we understand that from the Gospels. But, but who is Lord of all of this? Okay, who's Lord of the dead? Who's Lord of, 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 of the, the minions running around that, that run the place, that afflict people, okay, that bring destruction and plague and all this stuff? And of course, the Lord of the dead himself. Well, the answer is the Messiah. The answer is the Messiah. And so people who were familiar, again, with this literature, Psalm 91, the extra psalm, Psalm 151, again, the reference in extra psalm material about, hey, you know, David had written songs and suggestion, hint, maybe Psalm 91 is one of them. David had written psalms to perform over the possessed, four of them. Remember that Dead Sea Scroll we read a few minutes ago? So if you're familiar with this material, when Jesus shows up, and starts casting out demons, starts giving his disciples power over demons. The theological messaging is quite clear. This is 
again, this guy has to be the Messiah because only the son of David, only the messianic figure, only the messianic king would have been authorized, would have been empowered to do this. And, it, and, and to do it for real, as, as, you know, other than you know, being a pretender, he, he not only has the power, but he gives it to, he dispenses it to his followers, to his disciples. And again, it's no coincidence that when Jesus does this stuff, the first time that he does this is he sends out the 70. Okay, that, again, it, it's always done in conjunction with the launch, the kickstarting of the kingdom of God over against the kingdom of, of, of Satan. Again, all of these things have to be taken together collectively in context. They are part of the messianic profile that, is, that in and of itself is splintered, is scattered. And the pieces start coming together and converging into and around, you know, a clustered, you know, in connection with this figure, Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, again, the theological messaging would not have been lost to someone again familiar with the with these these texts and and I'm not saying they could quote them I mean I'm sure a lot of them could but even if they had heard them when Jesus starts doing this stuff the 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 bells and whistles are going to go you know going to start going off in their head they would associate this with messiah now one passage yet to to mention about that that people would have conceivably had in their head at least by the time of the writing of the gospels would be something Josephus says Josephus, in his Antiquities book, uh, and again, Josephus was a first century figure, so again, you would have had to, you know, the, the gospel readers and writers would, may not have had this, but certainly Josephus is going to be, is, is actually sharing Jewish tradition, you know, with his readers. He doesn't just make this up when he decides to write something down. He writes this, now the sagacity and wisdom which God had bestowed upon Solomon was great, so great that he exceeded the ancients insomuch that he was no way inferior to the Egyptians. Again, he's drawing on that First Kings 4 passage that we read, who are said to have been beyond all men in understanding. Okay, this is Antiquities 8.2.5. If you want the actual references, this is line 45 now. God also enabled him, Solomon, to learn that skill which expels demons, which is a science useful and sanative to men. He composed such incantations, again, utterances, songs, you know, this sort of thing, you know, stuff that you say or sing. He composed such incantations also by which distempers are alleviated. So he was a healer too. And he left behind him the manner of using exorcisms by which they drive away demons so that they may never return. Again, this is part of, of Jewish thinking. This was associated with Solomon. Again, because of some of the texts that we had read, you know, we read earlier in this episode. And by the time Jesus shows up, there's a body of tradition based upon, again, Qumran material, you know, Jewish material. This is this is Hebrew Jewish material that of course gets translated into the Septuagint and the, the you know Psalm 91, the extra Psalm, Psalm 151, which is in the Septuagint, also helps create this body of thought, this body of tradition that associated the son of David, okay, the son of Solomon, the Solomonic Davidic line, associated that messianic figure with the, the casting out of demons. And this is why. When Jesus starts doing this, nobody blinked an eye. Nobody said, hey, where, where's the Messiah supposed to be doing that? Chapter and verse, please. No, they don't say that. They, they again, have this, this expectation because of this material. And so that's why, uh, again, this part of the Messianic profile that we read in the Gospels that isn't very transparent in the Old Testament, why it's still a legitimate connection back into the Old Testament as part of you know, the, the, the messianic figure, the messianic profile.